painting outside um, um, in nature and, and uh, experiencing what you're depicting um, in real time uh, is a huge part of your work. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about one, how you do that, and then two, um, sort of why that is your approach. I think that the, um, it's interesting when I was younger, everything was, uh, came about from uh, my imagination. And then eventually I started painting from life. And when I painted from life, I, um, uh, you know, I saw uh, things that I had never seen before, especially color. I started getting involved in color and I, I felt that uh, I was connected more to color when I was outside. But then I got into uh, just uh, the nature of the landscape and what the meaning of the landscape uh, was. And I, I feel that that is what I shared with most, most of the students of Whitman. We did a figurative work and we did a lot of landscape. We did a lot of still life, but, you know, and also we concentrated on inventing paintings as well. So it wasn't a real focus, but I think that being in the present, uh, it gave me um, ideas. And this particular painting here, I painted Tillman Island because I have a studio there. Uh, you know, this is one of the things that I can tell you. Uh, the sunsets there are so inspirational that, you know, I can't pass up painting a sunset each night. But this is one looking down the narrows. And, uh, you know, it's more not necessarily um, it is all realistic. It is about the emotion that I'm feeling as well. So I think that I try to bring both that representation, but also the underlying um, feeling that I'm getting from the colors. And that's one of the things that I tell people. I, I do paint by feeling color. And I think that it's a, um, it's the, the, the thing that uh, it's almost very musical. So I, I really hear the music as uh, uh, WC said when he said uh, nothing's more musical than the sunset. So I think that uh, this is one of the things that I, I, I've come to, to love. So they become incredibly personal. This particular painting right now is in Africa. It's in the, the American embassy in Malawi. Oh, how cool. Imagine that, all right? Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is one of the ones, and uh, you know, and it is, it is of Tillman. So, um, you know, which is a very special place where, near where we all live, the Chesapeake Bay. So I think that's that's how I've evolved with the, these paintings. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful painting, and I've been there with you, and um, just the the sky and the water and the light and the reflection and the the boats and there's a there's a you're definitely able to communicate, uh, in my opinion. Um, not just individual pieces, but a whole, and not, and not just the way something looks, but the way something feels, and the way um, one could experience, um, uh, you know, a part of their life taking place in a, a situation like that. So um, I, I think it is really inspirational to hear you talk about this. Well, I think that also, Gavin. Um, I think that the other part of this is this is all painted in one session, mm -hmm. and this is a big painting. This is like a thirty-six by forty-eight. And that sun's not sitting still, is it? And that sun's not sitting still, all right? So the people have to understand how fast you're working and how aggressive you are and what your thoughts are taking place at the time. And I think that when I, when I paint, I'm in the flow. Mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the things about painting plein air is that you do get that change and you have to learn how to deal with it and make an idea from all that change. So, yeah, so that one is uh, Tillman. This one... Um, the painting that I did here is right from my, when you walk out of my door right now where I am in my studio, I come out my door, this is what I see. Mm -hmm. right? And I would see this every morning uh, when we moved here uh, that uh, I just thought was fascinating uh, just as a, as a subject. But I'm the kind of person that takes a subject, uh, I don't have to go very far. So I don't have to go on vacation somewhere to wind up painting. I can really paint right from my neighborhood. And uh, I think the um, thing right now is it's snowy out and it looks just sort of like this as well. But this is where the kids stood at the, bu at the bus stop. That, uh, <laughs> That's something I'd like to ask you about actually is uh, about the question of subject matter. One of, one of the major takeaways that I, to this day, I have always kind of taken for granted since um, you instilled it in us at Whitman is that um, 
a real artist and a real artist, I don't mean an artist with lots of experience. I mean, somebody who, who, you know, has declared that they want to create art, whatever level of experience they have. A real artist can take any scene and turn it into a great work of art. And that it's the abstract elements. I mean, I remember internalizing this in high school and it's the abstract elements of light and color and composition um, and those types of things that um, if we investigate and if we really get interested in, uh, will take any scene at all and, and at least give us the ability to turn it into something um, really exciting. Maybe you can talk to us about subject matter a little bit since you obviously lead your life the way that you're trying to lead it. You have a house in a beautiful part of Maryland. You have a house in another very beautiful part of Maryland. You paint what's around you. Um, but we see uh, a, lot of, a lot of similar elements of subject matter throughout your work. Maybe you can just talk about what you're drawn to and uh, what kind of grabs you. Yeah, I think that uh, most of the, the things that speak to me are uh, experiences I have with the moment. And, um, you know, the, I'm not the kind of person that wants to search out the grand view. I really uh, want a more personal, more intimate view, okay, of things. Mm -hmm. And I think the, um, or at least make the, the, the painting have that intimacy in some way, where it's the viewer connecting with the painting. But I think that the, um, the elements that we, you talk about that are, and both you and myself talk about in our classes, uh, you know, are the elements that I employ. So I try to pass those on to my students, but I think that one of the one of the things that's very important is uh, that you, as an artist, you see something in in the the subject that probably most people don't see, and I think that this is one of the things that helps you to paint it uh, well. And in the case here, I mean, there's a personal experience day to day with this particular view, you know, just going to the mailbox that I I feel that you know like. There's an artist by the name of Olaf Host, and you can look him up, but he was the one who just took the same building and he painted it, you know, every day did 200 paintings of it. He's, a, he's an artist from Denmark. It is a really unique artist, really inspirational to me. And, uh, and you know, it is about uh, being having a romance with your subject. So I think that I'm trying to give that, communicate that to my students, other than just that it's a picture that I don't have any um, interest in, but the fact that it makes a good painting, I think is one of the challenges for all of us. And I think that when you do get a painting that speaks in a personal way, I feel that that's important too. But you know, here I wanted to really combine the temperature, the atmosphere, uh, the, the wetness of the road, the distance, all right? And um, the color combinations were really, very unified. So it was really kind of interesting to, to have a lot of different mixing here. And I really enjoyed making this painting. As a matter of fact, whenever I look at this view, uh, the unfortunate thing is I always see this painting now. It's just, <laughs> it's like I have it's to a go, great painting. Well, I have to go beyond this painting, all right? This is, uh, <laughs> and by the way, this painting is in a collection with a, by a collector that's in uh, Shepherdstown, who I'll just tell you a story. Got to give Ben Summerford a lot of credit for where I am with color. And Ben was the instructor at AU when I went to AU and got my MFA. And um, th th it was very interesting, but th this collector has a number of my pieces. This is one of the later ones, but one of the first ones he bought, he put in his, and the house is just full of all of the Washington artists, a lot of names you, you would know, all right? Uh, and um, I walked in to have a nice personal tour and I looked at the painting and it was sitting next to Ben Summerford. And he didn't no, know kidding. the student of Ben's, all right? So it was really kind of neat. Uh, so I think that's where I am with this, uh, is trying to go after the color vibration and the, you know, just the general feeling that you would get from something like this. Yeah, uh-huh. So then what's, the next the next yeah, one. What's nice. Yeah. Well, this one, I, I love this painting. Um, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, how you arrive at the color decisions that you arrive at. Okay, the, uh, the thing that I do a lot with painting is first of all, just look at the warm and cool relationships. But this is a very interesting painting and I put it in this group for a number of reasons. Not only is it very geometric, which the other one was not as strongly geometric, but this is a painting that is based on the number three, which I didn't really connect until somebody said, 
you really sense the number three in it. And, you know, that's the basic number for um, design, believe it or not, and the most powerful number. You see it in the triangular compositions that a lot of artists have used. And uh, so uh, that's how it was composed. But then when I go after color, I go after the warm and cool relationships. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm really good at trying to study edges because I know that the edge becomes the focus. So I really build the painting. I mean, I'm, this is a painting that I actually painted uh, standing in water, all right? So it was like I was in about an inch of water right there at the bank, okay, doing this painting. And uh, the, uh, you know, it was the kind of thing that's going in the, in the, the town of Middletown, which is the town that I live in. But this is an older painting. This is the one, one of the oldest ones that I, I have in this group. And, um, you know, I've always come back to this composition because it really, it just really works so well in the kind of divisions that are there. But the colors, I'll just tell you this, I read color by the order by which I see it. And I really paint pattern. So I'm really going after uh, relationships. I'll paint the yellows in first. I'll, I'll try to find the yellow. Uh, then I'll try to find the blues. In other words, I really do um, uh, play the relationships of certain colors to one another. But, um, you know, it is that transition from, uh, from uh, warm color to cool color that feeling in this particular painting. So I think, did I answer that question for you? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about your compositions and perhaps tell us, you know, to what extent, even if it's just before you apply paint to canvas, even if you're on the spot, to what extent um, you sort of plan them out ahead of time and to what extent they just sort of emerge as part of your process and, and how these compositions come about because they're, uh, to my eye, uh, incredibly successful and incredibly unconventional. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I see people who, who, who you might consider influences, uh, um, but I don't see you doing things that uh, the conventional artist would do and that there are many ways to do these conventional, to take these conventional approaches. And you seem to have a, an approach to composition that is completely unique and completely successful. So maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Well, I think that I, when I was younger, I had a photographic memory. So I can really see the, the painting on the canvas. So I start with a, an image that's in my mind and uh, I have a, a good way of kind of structuring uh, the divisions of the rectangle. So I really sense where the rectangle, the strong divisions would be. And I think that the, um, the attitude towards space is I always, I have this uh, idea that you really deal with the foreground first and then you move into the background. So uh, I will put, this, put the sketch in, but the sketch will be more, uh, and this one, you know, I didn't do any preliminary sketches for this, though so this would be one that looks like it would be very well planned, all right? But the, um, uh, the things that I do look for uh, are the, the areas in the rectangle that are important. And I think each rectangle is different because of its dimensions. But then the other thing is that I, I look to deal with, you know, just the basic elements that we talk about, the foreground, the middle ground, the background. And I try to establish, uh, you know, like I said, the, the kind of divisions that you see here. And you can see where those vertical divisions are taking place. And in, inside each division is a, an element of uh, whether we want to focus there or we or we don't. So this one's very explicit. It takes you right to the point um, of where you're looking. And I think, uh, you know, when we you study lines, uh, that's one thing. The other thing is color and how color will lead you there too. And I, I do a lot of that because I really sense peripheral vision. So I whenever I focus on something, I take into consideration what that peripheral vision is. And I, and I try not to deal with anything and make it too complex if it's outside that, that realm of the peripheral, you know, peripheral vision. Yeah. So that's how that one worked. And then this one, this is one, uh, Gavin, that I did in the Bahamas. I would run these workshops and I do them all the time. And I think, uh, you know, we do these international workshops. As a matter of fact, I have one planned for September to Cinque Terre, all right, like, you know, and, and Lake Como. Uh, but I would go to Elbow Key in, in January and I would paint there. And this is one of the ones, you know, Elbow Key now has been devastated. 
uh, by that hurricane, the last one. But the, um, the thing that I am after really, I love color. So I love to interpret uh, you know, the feeling that I'm experiencing and to, to understand it. This is another one that's painted in one, one time, one session. So, so you had mentioned that you like um, that often you'll start with the yellows and then you'll paint the blues, just sort of go color by mm -hmm. color. Will that change if there's a really dominant color that is usually towards the end of your list of colors that you start with? I, I usually start with the dominant one uh, to, to just measure things off of. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Right? So I, I really will look at the, the dominating color, but, you know, also the dominating value. You really have to spend time, you know, looking at your lights and darks as well. But I'm about visual rhythm. And I think that I don't want to, depending upon the size of the canvas, how much information you're going to put in it. All right. It's a bigger mm -hmm. canvas. You probably will work with more information, but, you know, not necessarily. But the thing is, um, you know, if you work on a small canvas with a guy, you got to really simplify. Otherwise, it just is very hard to look at from a distance. All right. So I think, um, you know, this is one that's, uh, I went after, I really like the feeling of something like the feeling of water. And I know that paint can communicate that. If anything, what a great material we have to work with as artists, because you know it really, really gives us the range of uh, ideas, you know, and our experiences. And I think this is one of the uh, things that I feel uh, is important in my work is to give you the feeling of that water as well as the distance and uh, the play of the color of the light at that time of day and how the light might diffuse uh, an image. All right. So I, and then you have to compose it, which is, I think is the other part of it, which is the, the challenge, especially like the boat that's coming in with a sail, that wasn't there the whole time, you know? <laughs> and it's like, uh, when do you put something like that in? Well, you're always keeping your eyes open for anything that can make a painting uh, interesting. But then the other part is just to kind of keep things simple. So you really have to tell yourself you can't have everything, you know? And, um, and I, I like the rhythms. I, I'm very much, like I said, touch on music. I really feel the rhythm in the painting. So I, I think that's what I'm after. And Yeah, it really shows. But what you were saying about just the quality of paint, I think you, you managed to explore that a lot too. I mean, not only gi giving the, I'm reaching for my mouse pad, the, um, the giving a suggestion of the texture of the water in the way that the paint is, you know, rolling around and slopping against each other and, and physically creating waves of paint while blending the paint together to look liquid and then juxtaposing it against hard edges in the solids and building the paint up in some areas and then keeping it much thinner in other areas, which, which makes for both a very, you know, very just exciting abstract image uh, and experience and also a very believable um a very believable uh, suggestion of subject matter so i mean yeah there's a reason why we paint after 600 years or 2000 years or whatever isn't there yeah and i think you're you know one of the things you know that we are you know we we have to design it too at the same time and that's that is the, the challenge you know so you you the more you paint uh, you know, you know this, the more you make paintings, the more portraits you paint, the better you get at it, the more you understand it. All right. Absolutely. So I think, you know, uh, how many paintings do you want somebody to make before they really understand painting? About a thousand, you know? Sure, yeah, that's about right. Yeah, I think so. Somewhere in there, you know? Uh, so then the next one here, this is also an elbow key, and this is called a trumpet cloud in, uh, in the, the, uh, the harbor. And I've never experienced this anywhere else but there. And, uh, and it's uh, very interesting. I can go there and I can experience it almost every day. And it's really weird, the, 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 the visual sensation that you get from the place. So I'm very much like you saw with my, the house painting from across the street. I really think of place as being a, a unique and each place has its own kind of feeling. And this harbor particularly was like that. So that was a, that was a drama. And you know, I challenge, uh, not challenge, I, I kind of internalized certain artists. Um, this one, definitely Turner was a big influence on me. So, you know, do artists influence me? Uh, a lot, you know? Yeah, maybe you can tell us about some of your influences. I remember, 
uh, you telling me when we were walking through the Tate Gallery, I remember asking you who your favorite artist was. And at that time you mentioned Turner. This was, mm -hmm. you know, back then. Um, but yeah, maybe you can tell us some of your influences. Well, I think that Turner, when we hit Turner is a, a good example. You know, John Ruskin wrote that Turner was uh, his favorite, all right? And uh, it's hard to believe that Ruskin would have chosen Turner as his favorite because Ruskin believed in nothing but very realistic painting. <laughs> right, no improvements upon nature, right? Right, that's, that's how he judged painting. That's hilarious. But, but Turner was not like that at all. And um, what was interesting is that what Turner, what Ruskin said, the reason was that Turner got closer to God, all right? To God as nature and what nature really feels like, all right? And uh, I feel that too. I feel that there's a, a, a level of understanding that you try to reach uh, with the work that goes beyond just the image. And I think that, you know, Turner was one of the ones, uh, Degas is another for figure. I think that uh, Degas was able to bring music to his figures, which I, maybe because he did the ballet, maybe he was surrounded by music, but honestly, the, you know, his um, uh, work really communicates that kind of thing. And I believe, uh, you know, I, I like him uh, as much. I also like Soroya for color. I think that Soroya is one of the, um, uh, you know, outstanding painters, but he also expressed things in somewhat abstract terms. Matter of fact, early, the early stages of the paintings are really quite abstract. And sometimes he would leave his studies thank God that you'd be able to see because they were, they, I think they were as valuable as some of the big paintings that he did that, that are finished. So these are sort of the, um, some of the artists that I kind of look at, but the others, you know, I look at Matisse a lot. Matisse is somebody who I think has a, an inventive quality. And uh, though I don't see Matisse in my work yet, uh, I always constantly think of him. And maybe in my still life, I, I would get closer to, to Matisse, but, uh, you know, a lot of the sunsets definitely are inspired by Turner, for sure. Yeah, he's fascinating to read about traipsing through the Alps, you know, with his backpack before they had taken the trouble to carve roads, you know, out in the snow, painting in watercolor, and then then taking all that experience back to London. Yeah, he's, uh, he's really something. Yeah, and if you do study him, he is something. I mean, really, uh, that you hit it right on the head. I mean, he went to he only went to Venice like three times, but he produced like a, an amazing body of work. All right, it was really kind of interesting. I don't think he spent more than six weeks on, on all his trips, where he was able to do all that work. So he it, it was amazing. This one, uh, this is a, a one in Maine. So I'm about um, feeling movement. And, and I, I don't like painting things that are too still. So I really do try to create visual rhythm. So water, things like that always interest me. And this is a particular place when you go to Monhegan Island where you have um, you know, a lot of artists. I know that Robert Henry and probably Edward Hopper painted right from this spot, okay? And so it's really about how you would interpret it relative to them. And this is a good example of, of, of what I would say paint can do. So I really do try to bring up the properties of paint, which I think are, you know, the, the movement and that freshness. So this one of the ways that to, to my eye, you really show that in this is um, by juxtaposing the motion and the texture of the wave against the, you know, the, the hard, really static rock. And even though you managed to make the rock look like it's alive and in motion, and especially by, by pulling the foreground so close, you know, with those really sharp edges, um, the, you're you're really making uh, you're really showing us a juxtaposition in textures and in in motions um, that furthers the other one. I mean, if you had just painted the wave with nothing else in the painting, okay, but having that wave crashing against the rock really makes the wave look like it's so much more in motion, like the spray look like spray, the water look like water, the rock look like rock um, in a very, very personal sort of non-literal way, which I think is really successful here. Well, you know, it was, again, this was painted, you know, very quickly. So it was not like it's a painting that I would come back to. It's not a painting that I could ever reproduce. All right. I mean, I could take some of the ideas that I have here, try to repaint them if I wanted, but it would never come out like the strokes that 
are there at the moment that you paint them. And I think that's what you uh, you build on. You build the language on uh, the relationships that you form in the painting. And you know how much to put in and not, you know, not overdo it. And I think this is one of the ones that I like because of that simplicity, but also because of that energy. To me, that energy plays an important part. So, and then I like the color, you know. Yeah, me too. But you can't beat that turquoise, you know, whenever. Right. You it. So then this one, um, this is, the, of course, Great Falls. And I've painted this many times. This is a painting that went on like two or three years. So we're okay. some. Is this a really big one? I think I've seen this one, maybe in your yeah. truck. Yeah, this is also in in Africa right now. They they, they I'm in a, a a show with some really. Uh, I mean, you talk about uh, they have a, a group of photographers that are like the, the top photographers ever. You know, the history of photography, and it's really kind of interesting in that muse, uh, in okay. the, uh, uh, embassy. So you That's don't realize what the embassies have in them, you know, but they have all these treasures. And now I have these paintings with them, which I think is really, was kind of made me uh, really proud the fact that I was able to do that. But this one is, had a lot of struggle for me. So this was going back multiple times. So oh, this looked many good. times, many, many times. Uh -huh. And I would work from it from memory and then I would work on it, you know, take it back and then come back again. So I would say two or three years. So what were some of the struggles that you had with it? What gave you, what, I think it was what just did you have to find solutions for? Yeah, I think it was coming up with a natural way of seeing it, all right? It was so complex that it was hard to know how long to look at certain areas in the painting. And the light, of course, was changing so much that it would change the, the, even the pattern within a, a certain you know short period of time, half an hour, you'd have a totally different pattern of light and dark. So I think that that was one of the, one of the things. But, you know, it it, um, it came together pretty well, and I, I I like this one too because of the uh, the way it works, and it doesn't feel like it's been labored over, you know. Not at all. Yeah. So I think that's it too. So that was the drama in that one, and uh, you know I like I like going after dramatic things, but this is a different one, um, and uh, I, I show this one because, um, you know, I, I do like painting snow, and. <laughs> And, and that's because I think we see more color with the snow than any anything else. Uh, but yeah, the, those reds and blues, uh, everything that you manage to get into that snow really works. That strong yellow. Yeah, it's really interesting to try and play those those colors against one another, and then you know control the the way you look at the painting. And I think you know it was again this is one of these ones that's right down the street from where I was living, and um, you know I just try to pick what I thought was interesting, which was the line of the street going back towards this old mill, which is no longer there. And, uh, you know, I take advantage of elements in the design, these black and yellow signs, which I think would be very hard to integrate into a design. You know, I was just thinking that. I was thinking you managed to pull that off with great Elon, where uh, if I saw those, I'd think, gosh, I don't know if I need those in my painting. And yeah. they make perfect sense here. Those are the type of things that it'd be tough to put in a painting and have them not stand out or to completely decimate the entire thing. Yeah, and I don't usually leave things out. So I'll try to orchestrate because I know they have an influence on what I'm seeing, mm -hmm. right? So I try to integrate them into the, into the idea without having them be, you know, take over too much control. That's right? interesting. So you don't tend to leave out elements of subject matter, but you do obviously reduce the amount of information you're giving us. Yeah. How do you make that decision about when something, you know, the amount of attention you give to something in the painting? Well, I can read where the contrasts are. That's the first thing. So I really look at where my elements of tension, what I call tension are. But one of the things, just to call, call your attention to this diamond shaped sign on the left, you can see how the colors change, but they mm -hmm. change because one side of the, the sign is leading you into the painting. You definitely don't want the other side to, to take you out. So I think that I, you know, I, I warm up the other side because I feel it is not something that I'm looking at, all right? So I paint it just that way. You gotta understand, I keep my eye right on that focal point, which back actually is that little black dot on that building is where yep. I'm focusing, all right? And everything was actually centered around that tension. So it's really, I, I also like to pick things like that. I like to pick something really small that, that your eye will go to. 
And, uh -huh. and you know, instead of the 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 thing that we know will control us, you know, this is the this is the piece that I think you, you can kind of feel how it's resonating. So yeah, I I just uh, and then I play colors based on their value and that, but I do a lot with peripheral vision. So I really study what it's like to look within my peripheral vision. And when I'm making- You'll have your eyes focused on one thing and then you'll be sort of examining with your peripheral vision something else. Yeah, you have to paint the what's outside your peripheral vision just like you're seeing it when you're not looking at it. Right. You know, and I think that's where people go have their problems is that they wind up turning their head and looking at the spot, but that's not what you're doing, you know? So I think that's what I try to do is keep the eye in there. And then I like to really uh, bring some tantalizing color like this turquoise that's in the lower left-hand corner. Yeah, uh, so, balance against those warms in the road. I mean, it's just yeah. a great harmony. Yeah, so you recognize these things, you know? Of course. And then the next one, this is the most simple. I've always loved this one. I I've always been knocked out by this one. I see it all the time at Glen Echo, or I see a poster of it. Yeah. And I've always thought this is a great painting. This is a, a painting that uh, they actually made uh, into, um, I, I painted it for uh, a group called the Barnstormers when they were doing these barn painting tours here in Frederick. And uh, I went and had to go paint this painting. And that actually in the front of it is a bunch of birdhouses and uh, weeds and things like that. And you know, this is one where you come back and you edit and you really look at it and you, and you say to yourself, and you know, the Japanese, one of the things about Japanese painting is keeping things simple, you know, and this is all about simplicity. And I think, uh, and it's all about geometric. But the other part of it that I want people to understand is I, I read symbolism and that dark side of the building is the mysterious side. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a shadow to me. It's, it has, it takes on more meaning. And I think that when we look in going into a dark space, it actually changes our emotions. So I think that there's a, an interesting emotional play here as well. So that, yeah, this one is a, a powerful image because of its simplicity, you know? It's, it's interesting to hear you say that because for somebody who's clearly excited about exploring and pushing color and finding um, as many vibrant warms and as many vibrant cools as possible, you will often uh, take an entire area like a, a giant, portion of your painting, a giant shadow, and really reduce the amount of information that you're giving us. And in a, in a place where it would be very easy to take a, you know, a really pure purple or a really pure turquoise almost out of the tube and just stick it right in there and sort of electrify the color in the painting, you've really chosen to play that down. It's interesting to hear you talk about uh, an area where you really want to suggest the mystery that you're encountering. Yeah, and I think that one of the things about the darks, so always keep in mind that uh, that's where you have less information, you know? So I think that uh, I try to keep that simple, uh, but yeah. And then I, I, like I said, the element of symbolism, I read, uh, and when I teach painting, that's one of the things I touch on all the time is what's the symbolic meaning to the painting. And here you're kind of looking up at an angle that's uh, unique. In other words, you're looking at, in a kind of foreshortened way, looking up toward the sky because of the fact that it's sort of like an arrow taking you up, you know? Yeah. So that's how that worked. And then this one, uh, uh, this is a very interesting one, Gavin, because um, I always, being outdoors and painting, one of the things is that you start to come to understand nature. And I think the more you do, uh, the more you start looking at ideas that, and ask questions. For instance, I always ask questions about the Holstein cows. I know that, you know, when we look at insects, we know how they evolve so that they can disappear against their backgrounds. But the Holstein cows, when you look at a field, boy, do they stand out against that green grass. <laughs> and I'm always thinking to myself, well, what's the secret to the Holstein cow? And then I realized that they were like clouds in the sky. <laughs> right? uh -huh. And so here I do a lot with pattern. And I, I will tell you that I'm a pattern painter. So I really do look for repetition. And, uh, and that's how I build my ideas. And uh, so this particular cow had two shapes on it and uh, it helped me to see the two shapes in the sky. Yeah. And I think this is one of the things about making a design work. So this is another one where the cow is moving through the field and you're just trying to capture it at the moment that you're painting. And you have to just to be accepting of where the painting is at that stage because you can take it to another stage where it will be a different painting, 
but it, there's something um, I think authentic and uh, maybe perhaps uh, a little bit more truthful in that you're in this moment and you could take it beyond the moment, but at the same time, uh, that's a, a, then a different painting with a different meaning. And so this is where I, you know, where I have to just play the elements and try to come up with an interesting idea. And, uh, you know, this is how this one evolved. So I'll give you an idea, but the cows are always one of my favorites. I moved out here, you know, years ago, and I can tell you that, you know, they're, they're great subjects to work with. <laughs> well, you have certainly done a lot with them. Um, you have so many, so many, and there so many great cow paintings and, and the, the spontaneity of capturing, you know, that moment that you are in rather than overdoing it. Um, uh, I think we see perhaps the most in your paintings of cows, because anybody who's ever tried to paint anything that's moving knows that, um, you know, if you really are going for a literal representation of them, you're either going to drive yourself crazy or you're going to find a way to, um, to communicate the sense of the subject matter without being too literal, or you're going to take a photo and go home and do it in your studio. And um, I think that these have so much personality, but also so much spontaneity to them that um, I, I think that's one of the reasons why people love them so much. I mean, why you're your cow paintings are so famous is that um you know you it, it really is a sort of glimpse into just just living the life that you're living and experiencing the moment that you're experiencing and and um not overkilling it well and i think you touch on something i mean we can we can try to make uh, our lives more interesting but sometimes it's just that this is the way they are you know, and I tend to I tend to be that way. I tend not to try and go any further. We're going to uh, just discuss these re really quickly. I think uh, I want to just talk about these quickly. But I like painting figures also, and incorporating the figures into the painting. And this is the other one that's also in Africa at this time. These are big paintings, usually thirty six by forty eight or or bigger. Okay, and uh, this is a, a, a painting at Tahiti Beach in the Bahamas. And actually I'm painting on the spot, but it's painted a small one. And then I made it into a bigger one like this. So um, do you ask these guys to stand there for five minutes or 20 minutes or an no, hour? Just... No, I don't. And as a matter of fact, I have to go after them as fast as I can. <laughs> so it's like, no, there's no way that you're going to say, hey, stand there. All right. Uh, and you have to compose a painting. And it was very interesting when I composed this one and I, and I painted it. I was in Maui. I took... Uh, this to a gallery in Maui, and of course, uh, as soon as she saw the painting, she took me as a, 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 a in the gallery there. And I think that the interesting thing about that was that this speaks much more con contemporary from the standpoint of abstracting things and really, um, you know, playing with an idea. But it, I do like the backlighting of the sunlight, so mm -hmm. I think that's one of the other things. But then again, this is that simplicity too, where you're not really making a total what I would call realistic painting, but try to make a realistic feeling. So and there's an absolute, I've started using the word believable. Um, mm -hmm. There's an absolute, you know, believability about this um, in that that's what's going on when you're at the beach. The figures are in motion. They're not posing. You don't have two on the right, two on the left, and one in the middle. You know, there are people in the background. You're not sure exactly what they're doing. Are they digging? Are they playing? Are they... Um, it was the woman handing the other woman a book. It's just all part of one scene that, that we're experiencing. Yeah, and I think that, you know, my design, just so you, you know, if you take a look at the elbow of the guy and how the arm bends, it bends back toward the women. All right, I don't do that intentionally, but, you know, I can tell you that that's a, a, a good compositional element that can connect all three figures. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that this is the kind of thing that I, I do well when it comes to that. The other ones that I do well is sitting in a, a ball, ball game and painting. This is in Cuba with gouache and uh, painting the ball game. This is awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so much fun for me. I can, as a matter of fact, that signature on there is the center fielder for the Cuban team. Oh, no way. That's great. Yeah. All right. So, uh, but this is the kind of thing that I think art you know, can kind of serve. Yeah. And, uh, this is what, when I really enjoy being in the moment. So this one and this one, I think this is the one we're going to end with. 
This one is great. I mean, that motion on the guy on the right. Whew. This is this is painted in a hurricane. Wow. So I'm down at the beach at, uh, in Rehoboth and I'm doing a workshop and it's during the weekend in a hurricane and I've got to put it, uh, yeah, we're out at the beach. Right? Well, it drives me crazy to paint in the wind. I take my hat off to you for being able to do it. The wind, I mean, I'll paint in the rain or the snow, I don't care, but the wind will drive me nuts. So I salute you for this one. Well, this is it. And I wanted to end with this one because I wanted you to see that this is my personality. I, I really do want to paint my personality and what I feel um, you know, is uh, exciting. And, you know, I put, uh, to do that, I have to put myself in exciting moments. And that's where Turner said, tie yourself to a mast. <laughs> that's, the, that's the way that works, you know? So, um, yeah, so I hope it, it, you get an idea who I am at this point. And I really appreciate you doing this interview for sure. Oh, it's, I'm dying to get out of here and go paint now. I mean, it's, it's been really uh, uh, exciting and instructive for me to talk to you about this and get a little insight into your process. So thank you for taking the time. You're welcome. And honestly, I think, uh, you know, I, I love uh, the, the kind of camaraderie that we have and, uh, you know, the years of, of experience uh, working together. And, you know, this, uh, the Yellow Barn means a lot to both of us. So I think this is, you know, where we are. And uh, uh, if anything, uh, just want to make everyone aware that we have such great uh, things going on there and with such great uh, talent, you know, uh, amongst the, all the instructors. It's an incredible community that you've built. And you've, as I say to people, you've given us all a place to be artists. 